Oh, it's time for the truth about running backs, the most important position in fantasy football. We know, look, Christian McCaffrey, he's consistent. But what was, what was the consistency of guys like Aaron Jones and, and Mark Ingram? Are they good enough? Stay tuned and find out. Hey, this is Kenyon Drake. You're listening to the Fantasy Footballers Podcast. Welcome to the Fantasy Footballers Podcast, coming to you from pristineauction.com studios with your hosts, Andy Holloway, Jason Moore, and Mike Wright. Oh, welcome in. Excited to be back with you Tuesday, January 21st. The Fantasy Footballers Podcast. It's a running back truth episode. Andy, Mike, and Jason. You can find us on Twitter at the FF Ballers. Fresh off of championship weekend. Oh, yes. This is a good one. Half half good. Half good. Yeah, I mean. <sighs> I wouldn't say you'd call that good. I would say that it was not as good. You're you saying know. if it's half good, it's yeah. not good. Yeah. A good championship weekend would be. Two amazing games. No, then it would be amazing. I feel troubled. That one's easy. So Brooks is out of town. He's actually on vacation. We have Al Borland running the the switches and the, the dials. Switches, and it just was bad timing for Al in general. Isn't that right, Al? Yeah, it's right. Uh, so we were on Slack talking about the 49er game. Al's a humongous Packer fan. <laughs> um, and it was a rough weekend, but I, I felt like the games were a little merciful. Like I knew I could – you know, plan some stuff for the second half of the game last night. But here we are, Kansas City, San Francisco. Patrick Mahomes doing basically everything for the Chiefs. Jimmy Garoppolo doing basically nothing for the 49ers. Although I'm, I'm always hesitant to criticize the Tannehill-Garoppolo type of games because you do what's asked of you. He didn't yes. do anything wrong. He just uh, he just put up seventy seven yards passing right on I mean, six completions. It's yeah, it's one thing. It was like he, he played a qu a quarter of a quarter of the game. <laughs> right, it's one thing if he plays poorly. He just didn't play. I mean, that's uh, that's coach's decision. It's DNP. I believe that Emmanuel Sanders and Debo Samuel could have like ran out for their routes and just set up a little table and had a meal. Like they were unnecessary. 29 carries for Raheem Mostert. I was so surprised that when Tevin Coleman went out that it was just Mostert for yeah, well, every yeah. carry for the rest of the no game. No Matt Breida? Yeah. In fact, I didn't say no Matt Breida just now because I didn't want to sound stupid in case he was inactive. No, like, he was there. That's how not used he was, is I thought maybe he was just inactive for the game somehow. I thought maybe you forgot what his name was. <laughs> like, it's only Breida because uh, Matt – Burrito. No, he was. <laughs> and also, <laughs> thanks a, thanks a lot, Mostert. Thanks for showing up for my beat the ballers two weeks ago when I picked you. <laughs> it's just very frustrating watching a guy that you you that's, you that's get gonna you be hype the up and you say he's gonna be great and then he's non-existent and, and then, then you try to take credit this week for your hype because yeah. even though he didn't do anything for you. The other week, this is still the credit you want because it's how we cope. It's almost like no one knew Raheem Mostert could do anything until now exactly. when you said it. When I said it first. Uh, you can find us on Apple Podcasts. Appreciate you subscribing, reviewing the show. We're on Spotify. We're ad-free on Stitcher Premium. And obviously the YouTube channel, youtube.com slash the fantasy footballers. The miracle run for the Titans falls short, 35-24 Kansas City and 37-20 the San Francisco game. Let's just get it out of the way right here, right now. Who's winning the Super Bowl? Kansas City. Yeah, I've, I've got the Chiefs by six. I want the Chiefs to win. It's going to be tough. I, I think I, I'll just stick with my, like, before the playoffs began pick, which was San Francisco over the Chiefs. So they're a machine. San Francisco is a machine. They are, but, like, if they get – Tyreek, because you know, like San Francisco, they have great secondary. Part of that is Richard Sherman has been absolutely outstanding this year, recovering from a massive injury. Tyreek Hill is not the type of wide receiver that Richard Sherman can guard. 
Like you, he mugs people at the line. He's a very physical dude. But as soon as Tyree Kill slips past him, I mean, he'll he'll be able to take him out of some a couple of plays when he's lined up on him. You know, he'll he'll jam him good. But there'll be plays that if 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 he doesn't get a hand on him, he'll will just be gone. Two great head coaches. Really excited for the opportunity for Andy Reid to get the victory. You know, as a Cardinal fan, I can't root for the 49ers, but I do think they'll end up on top. And there, there was some classic Andy Reid shenanigans going on at the end of that first half, man, yes. where he got bailed out by Mahomes' ridiculous – His tw- run? His 20-yard run. But you're like, you have timeouts, Andy Reid. What are you doing? Never heard of him. Never heard <laughs> Apparently. of him. Apparently. All right, let's do some buy-sell. Buy or Sell, presented by Pristine Auction. All right, today's Buy Sell, it's a simple question. Hollywood Brown, Marquise Brown, is he a top 24 wide receiver Mm. in 2020? Let me give you a lay of the land here. He finished the year this past year at wide receiver 46. I don't really care about that at all. He missed some time, but he was 46 for 584 and 7 on 71 targets. He finished as a top 12 wide receiver in fantasy three different times. By the way, that's the same amount as Stephon Diggs, Jarvis Landry, Tyler Lockett, Odell Beckham. Oh, more than Odell. Only had a 16.7% market share in the offense. What do you think? Yeah, so this this is going to be interesting. I mean, his struggles this year. I loved Hollywood coming in, and now you've seen a Baltimore Ravens offense that has taken a major step forward because Lamar Jackson has taken that step forward as a passer. So I, he's the clear number one wide receiver for a top, you know, uh, offensive team. So you usually would put those guys in the top twenty-four. The issue here to me is injury concerns. Right, he came into the NFL already injured. He missed games. He got banged up. He's a tiny little guy out there, but he is electric. And when I am you know, statting these guys out and looking, I, I usually assume, unless there's an extreme case of someone who just has never in their career basically been able to play a season, I project health. And so I assume he will be inside my top 24, but he'll have a high risk rating, right? Because we've talked about the list, Frank, uh, and the, the type of injury that he's had before where the chance of re-injury on the first surgery is is you know, it's like 20%, which is really high, even though it's still a, it's still a minority. So he'll be a very high-risk top 24 guy for me. Yeah, I think top 24 is, is pre- it's pretty easy for Hollywood Brown. He, there were so many games where he wasn't even on the field for f- like 50% of the offensive snaps for Baltimore as, as he worked his way back from injury. Oh, it's because he's not a tight end, Mike. They only <laughs> allow – they play six tight end. Yeah. <laughs> How surprised will you be when their first round pick is a tight end? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, seriously. <laughs> we can't get a look. I well, like the math adds up. It's working for them. They yeah. they had a great season. More tight ends means more wins. I like the fact that even though it was I mean, they lost the playoff game, his highest percentage of snaps was this last game. Eleven targets, over hundred yards. I know they're trying to catch up, of course, but See, like I feel like a top twenty-four should be pretty easy for Brown. Yeah, I I'm buying it as well. And the truth is, is he's built to be the kind of player that both finishes in the top twenty-four and possibly disappoints you because of consistency, because of big plays, because of you know piling up a Stefan like a Stefan Diggs top twenty-four type season is yeah I'll probably buy. the template for what Marquise Hollywood Brown will do where. Some games, the running game, Lamar on the ground, you might not need Hollywood. That's a good comp. And if you go back to our truth episodes of wide receivers and you look at how Stephon Diggs, you know, he, he had a great finish. End of the year, he's a good fantasy wide receiver. But the truth is he hurt players as often as he helped them. So maybe that is a template saying, eh, be careful. I love what well, I saw on the field. You just want to see more of it on the field. Yeah, you, and, and you want to be able to see a target volume that allows for consistency yeah. in fantasy football. And, and you just brought it up, right? If, if they're dominating certain games, he can just be unnecessary. Right, right. That was Buy or Sell from Pristine Auction. Check them out, pristineauction.com. Use the code BALLERS. You get a $10 credit towards some sports memorabilia, autographed sports gear. Let's get into some news. 
news and notes from around the league. We did just get back from Las Vegas. We were at the Fantasy Sports and Gaming Association's uh, Winter Conference. We took some hardware back, including the industry's best podcast award, which I was pretty amazing. Yes, and super honored to win that. And it's a reflection on you guys, the listeners, on and, and where the shows come. But uh, it was pretty cool. And I'll jump in. Thank you so much, everyone who voted for us for for numbers of things. But for me personally, I got the fan vote for the fantasy analyst of the year, and look, ev- everyone was trying to get this award if you saw twitter you saw everybody was pushing for it so the fact that the the foot clan overcame heavy heavy hitters in the industry uh humbled as always and just really really thank you for that the foot clan's undefeated yeah that's true i mean you guys are amazing yeah and gals uh in the news we've got larry fitzgerald coming back in our big news in our big news for a 17th (laughs) season this really is uh yeah the amount of exclamation points on the end of the sentence has to do with us living in Arizona, but Larry's coming back for a 17th year at the end of the day. He's going to help Kyler more than he helps your fantasy team anymore because he's probably a 600 receiving yard type of player at this point in his career, but having another reliable pass catching third down weapon. That's how I look at him now. So that's good for Kyler as they piece together this wide receiving core. I saw a great tweet from Pat Thorman. Uh, <laughs> just said it said something like, uh, "Hey Siri, set my set my reminders again to uh, draft Larry Fitzgerald in August and trade him in October." Right. This yeah, is, the season it starts to disappear later on. He's got yeah. like two or three games left in him. But as soon when his fresh legs are there, he's still great. Um, this was a huge surprise. A lot of news took place uh, between last show and now. Luke Keekley announced his retirement after eight seasons. Now, we're getting blamed in a fantasy reaper Uh, type of way for this. Yes. Who picked him? I picked him because it's a phenomenal pick. So this is your fault. So we said which – we were asked – was it on the Footcast? Yes. We were asked – Footcast or – Oh, it was the AMA. Was it? Whatever. We were basically asked what current active NFL player, if you wanted him to be a coach – He'd have to leave playing and be a coach right now. And it was like, Jason's like, Luke Keekley. Yeah, because he's going to be a great coach. So now he's open to the idea of coaching. Obviously retires at a younger age before he turns 30. Eight seasons, one of the best on the field ever. Huge blow to the defense in Carolina. They're in rebuilding mode, but you know maybe it's even more exhaustive now on both sides of the ball. The Jags, we talked about it. They fired uh, John Filippo. Bears hired Bill Lazor as their offensive coordinator. Lazor. Bengals offensive coordinator. And the Giants hired... And the Giants. The Giants hired Jason Garrett as offensive coordinator. So... What? Let's try to... Let's just try to step back from the meme life of Jason Garrett clapping on the sideline. What? The fatigue. When he was the primary offensive coordinator in Dallas, when he was calling the plays... They had some pretty nice fantasy finishes, top 10 finishes on that side of the ball. You wonder how much the Giants are making this move based on that or based on, you know, Knowledge. St- sticking it to the Cowboys in some capacity. And, yeah, brain drain. Yeah, I mean, I, I think you can brain drain easier than making him your offensive coordinator. <laughs> um But, yeah, obviously this is – nobody has more intimate knowledge on the roster of the Cowboys – than Jason Garrett on planet Earth right now, and he goes in division to become the offensive coordinator. We'll see Cowboys at least twice a year. That's pretty cool. It's an interesting hire. He stays in division. It's going to be weird seeing him on that sideline. He'll still be in blue. Yeah, he's just going to save money on the shirts and have them. (laughs) Just inside out. (laughs) Inside out. (laughs) You can still see the stitching of the Cowboy, (laughs) of the star. That's funny. Oh, that would be brutal. And uh, John D. Filippo, the aforementioned fired uh, offensive coordinator from the Jaguars, I believe he went and is now the quarterback's Court- coach for the Bears, right? Working with Mitch Trubisky. Mm. He luck. likes the challenge. Good, good luck. <laughs> he's, he's one of those guys who really likes the challenge. All right, we've got running back truth. We ready to jump into that? Yep. Let's do it. You want answers? I think I'm entitled. You want answers? I want the truth! You can't handle the truth! 
All right, we're diving into the running back position. Just finished our two wide receiver truth episodes. If you didn't catch them, go back and listen. They were last week's episodes of the show. But we're looking at running backs now. There's a really good article up on the website by Jeff Greenwood, thefantasyfootballers.com. It's a 25 running back statistics article from 2019 if you want to reflect a little bit more on the position. But just as a quick reminder, we're digging into the consistency of the running back position. And we're looking at the fantasy finishes in terms of, you know, how many great games did a player have? And we define that as more than 22 fantasy points. How many good games where they went out and put up more than 10? And how many were bust games that were fewer than seven fantasy points? They really hurt you on the week and comparing their fantasy finish with the truth of their season. How consistent were they, right? Yeah, I mean, that you know, it doesn't matter if a guy finishes – super great at a position but didn't help you win a championship or win enough games to get to the playoffs. Those things are things we need to analyze at this point in the season. And when it comes to running backs, the top end running backs, which we're talking about today, are the most consistent category in fantasy football. Obviously, not necessarily based on the draft season, getting everything right or wrong. But now that you look at, okay, th from top to bottom, the best finishing running backs, these are the guys that just week in and week out – got the job done. What is amazing and <clears throat> holds true for the umpteenth year in a row is when you compare ADP data with how running backs finished and you just look at the curve of where was value in the draft. It is so incredibly top heavy every year. It held true again. The best running backs are taken earlier in the draft. That doesn't mean you're getting everything right. It's just the ones who pop were always taken early. And and that's compared to other positions. You're saying you're finding more consistency at running back at the top of the draft. Exactly. You look at rounds 10, 11 at wide receiver. There were some big names, tight end, quarterback. A lot of these guys went late. And when you talk about you know the top 24 running backs, very few of them actually. The fantasy industry is just getting – so so much smarter on pegging uh, the next running backs in line that you know we still obviously make mistakes but invest early in running backs is the point yeah i mean you still had situations at the top of the year and we'll talk about them saquon mixon that didn't help you early but when you start at the top you got to start with the mvp of fantasy football christian mccaffrey number one in fantasy finish number one in consistency rank we have consistency charts on the website and when you look at this season for christian mccaffrey it is, it's just unbelievable. Because, I know, what a loser in week two, am I right? Right. I mean, 70% of the time he's putting up not a just a good game, but a, a great game, a more than 22 fantasy point game, a top 10 finish type of game. There were two weeks this season where he did not finish as a top 10 running back. It's impossible. It's and he did that with, a, with backup quarterbacks. I mean, just a, a really bad situation on the offense. Like this was a this was a ludicrous year for well, McCaffrey. I mean, look, he he his reception total was second in the NFL. Uh, like in, I'm saying, in wide receivers, you right. look at wide receivers, 116 receptions, 1,005 yards, four touchdowns. That's absurd. You get two players in one roster spot when you have Christian McCaffrey. 44% of his total fantasy production came via the air. Only 18 wideouts in NFL history have that 116 I, catch total. Honestly, I think it's actually le less. Because I'm looking at the list right now, and there's a couple duplicates in here. Like Wes Welker did it a few times, and Chris Carter has two seasons. So that's just total seasons. Yes. So if you, if you cut down... 18 wide receiver seasons wow. at 116 or more. Yeah, I mean, if you basically, if he stubbed his toe on the first play of all his road games and you only counted the home games, he's the running back 11 on the year. He's still an RB1. So uh, the, the only question out there that we have is if you don't take CMC at 101 <laughs> next year, are you legally insane? Is that uh, enough of a reason to be committed? I can't fathom the rationale next year to get so, yeah, Saquon. Okay, uh, Garrett's going to take over. He's worked with Zeke for so long. Uh, uh, but, what? I mean. New coach. New coach. I mean, that, that's that's oh, the only. Murder. Like, <laughs> ja Rule, coach of the team. I mean, uh, yeah. There's he did, be, the, the fire Festival was a disaster when he tried to run that. There's going to be change, and there's going to be narratives to try to have talking there, points. There aren't, though. But there the, really aren't. Like, it, I'm no, trying to have a I know. discussion. I went through my brain. I went through to find a Saquon <laughs> argument. There isn't one. 
Do I get a first round pick along with Saquon if I take him at one on one? Otherwise, it's CMC. Yeah, it is. Now, yeah. what's incredible here is where I mean, we're already diving into some truth right out of the gate. Aaron Jones was the number two overall fantasy running back. Aaron Jones of the Packers. I think I read yesterday in a tweet, um, 23 touchdowns in 18 games played this year for Aaron Jones. Yeah. His consistency rank, however, 18 at the running back position. He busted, which is a lower, fewer than seven fantasy points, 31% of the time. 69% of the time he was in, uh, he had a good game, and 38% of the time, great games. Now, his... Great games were special. Week five, number one overall. Week eight, number one overall. Week 14, number two overall. These were weeks where if you had Aaron Jones, you ended up on the winning side of the matchup. And in addition to those high upside situations, if you were able to get to the playoffs with Aaron Jones, yeah. which a lot of people were not, he's certainly not the easiest to get there. But if you got there, he really helped you win the championship because weeks 14, 15, 16, he was two of those. He was a top five running back that week, had monster performances, but this is the issue, right? Did you get to the playoffs if you had him? Five bust games is not a small number. There's nobody else in the top 24 running backs who had five bust games. Wow, really? The, the highest number in the top 12 running backs was two. Two bust games, and then you've got him here with five games I, where he just destroyed your your roster spot. I don't even – it sounds crazy because it shouldn't be ignored, but I don't even care about the bust games very much when talking about Aaron Jones for 2020. You, We all know the talent. We've seen the talent out there on the field. We've seen the success of the offense that they're running, 13-3, and three, Matt LaFleur. There's some consistency going into next year in scheme and game plan. What I care about is the touchdown total and how that drove that number two finish and how regression is inevitable heading into next year, which makes Aaron Jones the number one candidate that I have in terms of overdrafted. You know, the, the number one candidate to be drafted at a higher draft value than what he represents, which means you could be really disappointed because he had 19 touchdowns in the regular season. And where does that go? Is that does that go does to, he get double does it go to digit? twelve? Because that's beautiful if it's twelve. It, yeah, that's what I was gonna say. I mean, it, imagine he gets ten touchdowns. That's a really good number. Right. Like that's a number that a running back is coming into the year going, I want double digit touchdowns this year. But now take nine touchdowns away, and he was not very good for your fantasy roster. So he had a rushing touchdown on every fourteen point seven five carries. Now for some context. Uh, of the top 20 fantasy running backs, the, the person who was closest to him in that is in like a small number of rushing attempts for every touchdown was Todd Gurley at 18.6. And like I was trying to do some comps of this thing, and it, he it's very reminiscent of Alvin Kamara from just two years ago, where Alvin Kamara was scoring on every 13.85 rushing attempts. We all know what happened to Alvin Kamara, the touchdown. Regression. I mean, it hit him too strong. Honestly, I got Camara will bounce back. But last year, Camara every thirty-four carries turned into a touchdown. Like that's that's this what past, can, this past season. Yeah, and that's what can happen. I mean, you can go back uh, a, a bigger amount of years, but Lashawn McCoy had that monster touchdown year, twenty plus, and it followed it up with just a handful of touchdowns. These are these are why we don't. I still we think don't seek out touchdowns. There are guys. There are 100% guys that are more efficient, and I don't expect Aaron Jones' number to drop from the you know the the 15 carries to like what what happened to Leonard Fournette this year. But I'm with Andy that I want to see what happens with that ADP because Aaron Jones, when so when such a high percent of your fantasy total comes from 16 rushing touchdowns, that's that's dangerous. Well, and you have to go down to the number eight overall running back before you get a carry total less than Aaron Jones. He had 236 carries. Now, it was great to see him involved in the passing game. Number eight, is that where Austin Eckler is? No, it's Mark Ingram. But uh, Well, Eckler's got to be below him too. Did I miss that on Eckler there? Yeah, Eckler only had 132 over? carries. Sorry, okay, so that's at six. But I think Aaron Jones is a top eight player for next year. Don't get me wrong, but I think he's going to be drafted you know, inside the top four, somebody shooting for that same type of total. You know, yeah, it, were, it's. I don't want to take anything away from him. He was really, 
he it was a big difference when it came to facing top running defenses and bottom running defenses too. He scored eight fewer fantasy points per game against top sixteen Ds. Yeah, I mean the the so what is the truth about Aaron Jones? The truth is he was excellent for you this year in total fantasy points. He was very inconsistent and it came on the back of too many touchdowns for the low volume count to rely on it next year. So you've got a talented back coming into 2020 where he's not going to score as many touchdowns and you need to not draft him to repeat this performance, right. even though he's very good. Before we move on to running back number three, I want to thank today's sponsor, Simply Safe. Simply Safe Home Security is like getting commercial grade enterprise level security. Safe like CMC, not like Aaron Jones. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. You get this for your own home. Think about the security Fortune 500 companies use. That's exactly the kind of security you're going to get with Simply Safe. There's a break in. Simply Safe uses real video evidence to give police an eyewitness account of the crime. And that means police will dispatch up to 350% faster to your normal burglar alarm. Look, you got to protect from those, those who burgle, those who wear the mask. Stay away. <laughs> Look, they got entry, motion, glass break, sensors, guards inside. Look, a guard inside. We use Simply Safe in our studio. It's been protecting us for years. We highly recommend it. Visit simplysafe.com slash footballers. You'll get a free shipping and a, and a 60 day risk free trial. You got nothing to lose. Go now to simplysafe.com slash footballers so they know that our show sent you. That's simplysafe.com slash footballers. All right, at number three, Derrick Henry. He was the fifth most consistent running back. 47% of the time he put up a great game. That's an impressive total. Yes. 80% good games, 13% bust. Pretty much a beast. 303 carries. 1,540 yards. 16 touchdowns. No passing game involvement, really. 18, 18 Which receptions. Which is so weird. You would think it would just accidentally happen if you're on the field for that many snaps. Well, it, but. Like, you see him in the screen game. I mean, at least once or twice a year, he rips off a 70-plus yard they screen. They should up it. Give him why, a couple more Why not try more? Yes. Because he's not in. Because <laughs> on right. third down, Deion sure. Lewis still was on the field. I mean, I saw this in the playoff game, and I was like, come on, man. <laughs> I, I said this about Mark Ingram and Justice Hill. Right. It's like, I get it. I know why you're out there. I know you've got a role. I know that you've been in practice. That's why, right? You're in practice and you've got you got your third down formation and everybody goes out there and it's like Justice Hill has his role or Deion Lewis. But you throw a screen to Mark Ingram or Derrick Henry, you're going to be a lot happier with the result more often than not. That being said, here we go. 102.7 yards per game. That's a league leading total. I, this was just a fabulous year for Derrick Henry. He's a free agent, an unrestricted free agent. He's not ready to talk about his salary yet and his uh, upcoming upcoming contract, right. but we are, and uh, it's hard for me to see him leaving Tennessee. And the truth for Derrick Henry was he should be happy that Marcus Mariota got benched because those first six games, he, like, he was fine. Like He was solid. He was, he was performing. We it, wouldn't be talking about him right now in this show if, not, if that not a transition three, doesn't happen. But he was performing the way that he had been drafted. I mean, he was drafted basically as a, you know, a, a running back two, and the first six weeks with Marcus Mariota, he was the running back fourteen at with fourteen point one points per game. He had two great finishes, but then the other ones, you know, low end running back two, he was averaging nineteen carries for sixty nine rushing yards per game. Marcus Mariota gets benched. Ryan Tannehill comes in. This was the number that was the most uh, insane to me. With Mariota, 19 for 69. With Tannehill, 21 carries a game. So just two more carries a game. 125 rushing yards per game. And now that's bloated by some monster performances, but those monster performances also happened. It was just, it was such a transition for the Tennessee Titans offense to put Ryan Tanhill in there at quarterback, and it turned into massive, massive fantasy production. Just an increase of, of numbers across the board, snaps per game, rushing yards, fantasy points per game. It was, it was a really big deal for him. I think that's, I mean, that's what winning does, right? Yes. You win. You put a quarterback in. You're more competitive. You start winning ball games. A.J. Brown's ascent. Winning 
game scripts plus Derrick Henry equals happy fantasy owner. Well, he was he was only in in those first six weeks. He was only in on about fifty eight percent of the offensive snaps. That number jumps up to sixty eight percent. Well, and that's because at the end of those games, like Andy said, they were winning. And so, if yeah. this is a team you project to be winning next year, assuming he is back with the Titans, then he should repeat. And there's going to be a lot of conversation about regression with Derrick Henry, the touchdown numbers being bloated. The, yeah, he, had, the, he had 16, right? Same as Aaron Jones on the, the ground? Uh, I'm, I'm not sure. That is correct. He's 16. You. Um, you know, the, the craziest stat that I've seen is their red zone efficiency. When they got in the red zone, they scored a touchdown pretty much every single time. Uh, no field goal. Did goals. you see that in the, in the game yet, uh, over in the, the weekend? Game, yeah. The fact that their field goal had – they hadn't kicked a field goal in 49 days. Yeah, I mean, when you get in the red zone, you score a touchdown every time. That, so that's not going – you know, you're going to hear a lot of conversations about what's going to stop him from repeating it. And I think that Derrick Henry is just an outlier human being. Yeah, it's like Marshawn Lynch's touchdown potential when he was at his peak. You didn't come into the year saying, you know, regression to under 10. I mean, 15, 12 to 15 touchdowns in the same role seems really reasonable for Derrick Henry. He is – he has taken over the lead dog of the team. He is the center of the offense, and next year I'll pro be projecting him to to be what he was this year, which is a dominant running back on the ground. As long as he's on the Titans. Sure, yes, right. which I believe. Well, he might get Zeke money. He might get that type of cash. Yeah. So I still am going to side more often than not on the more balanced PPR element of a Zeke or a – Dalvin Cook or a yeah the eighteen receptions that that sucks man but it does show you that even in today's NFL you know that that was a distraction from drafting Derrick Henry it's not like we came into the year thinking oh maybe he'll be involved in the passing game we said he won't be so that means he must be brought down a rung or two and uh, he said otherwise I mean when you finish at three overall five inconsistency you can still get it done without the passing work if you're an outlier yeah, yeah. He, exactly you have to be an outlier we're calling we're calling it he's an outlier yeah like, as in he's going to continue to be an outlier unless he shrinks right yes uh, <laughs> don't leave him in the dryer couple, too long <laughs> or the the man comes out of the the robot <laughs> <laughs> the, the the big it's an, it's uh, an alien the overcoat comes yeah. down and all of a sudden you're like wait a minute <laughs> it was Dion lewis <laughs> Just and friends. <laughs> All right. Number four, Ezekiel Elliott. It'll be interesting for us to reflect on Zeke's yes. year. Number four overall, consistency of number three. You look at his fantasy finishes, he never finished outside the top 24 on the entire year. He never busted. 94% of the time he was good, so that's 10 or above. 31% great games, most of those happening over the back half of the year, especially weeks 11 through 15. Consistent at home, consistent on the road, consistent against good defenses, consistent against bad ones. Zeke was so good that you're disappointed in him because he wasn't great. He felt he was just strangely so, vanilla. He was so good and solid, but never gave you those, especially in the beginning of the year, right? You, your first 10 weeks of the season, you want you drafted a guy to be more like CMC, to be more like Saquon last year, more like Zeke of years past, where you have these monster two, three touchdown games and 150 yards and, you know, he's more Derrick Henry, the four finishes inside the top, inside the top four on the week. Zeke never finished inside the top four. Yeah, so, I mean. Or, I'm sorry, he finished at four, but he never right. finished in the top three. three. So I think that was the issue is you missed the giant big blow up games, but he was so unbelievably consistent. You never, you never were let down by Zeke. He never hurt your team. And you know what his longest run of the year was? I don't. You want to take a guess? 40. Mike, I you know, know what you it already is. know. Yeah. 33 yards. Wow. So that's a part yeah. of it too. Flashy plays and then the flashy top three fantasy finishes distorted what the truth was. The truth was Zeke was pretty much what you wanted to get. It just didn't come in the same fashion in the past, and it came on a reduced amount of passing game yeah, you know, the success. Targets dropped from 95 to 71. His attempts were actually slightly down per game. He still had the second most touches at the running back position. But what we did get was the, the positive regression for rushing touchdowns where he had that weird 
six. He had six rushing touchdowns two years ago, and it was just like, what? How was is, how is a man carrying the ball 300-plus times getting six rushing touchdowns? Do you – I know we're going to break down all the coaching changes in a specific episode, but do you have any gut initial concerns, worries, anything of that nature with McCarthy coming in, or is this just a matter of, look, we know what Zeke is. He's paid to be Zeke, and $90 million later he's the same yeah, guy. Yeah, if it w- – Honestly, if it weren't Jerry Jones at the top and it was Mike McCarthy coming in, I might at least have some concerns in the back of my head, but there's there's no way that McCarthy came in talking to Jerry Jones and saying, well, I'm going to have this split. Let's squeeze out the $90 million yeah, man. I'm going to split backfield and Jones say, no, I, I just paid that man. He will be the focal point of the offense. Yeah, I think that there's probably even a higher probability that the passing game involvement could ascend a little bit under McCarthy, but we'll see. Uh, Did you have any other thoughts on Zeke, Jason, before we move on to Dalvin Cook? No, I I guess the only curiosity I had in my brain, it's almost, it's crazy to think like, oh, the Zeke holdout. Wait, was that this year? Yes, that was this year where he came, he didn't miss any games or any It was overshadowed by Melvin's. Sure, but I I just, I feel like that was 12 years ago at this point. It's like, wait, that was this season where he came in late, so maybe that... You know, we talked about how he was really – he was more of his dominant self towards the end of the season. You know, those first six weeks were rougher for him. Again, he never busted, but he just wasn't dominant. wonder if any of that had any kind of factoring in coming in without the training camp and Listen, without, you know. Yeah, it could have. I Before we talk to Alvin, I'm going to pause because I've, I've realized something about this show. It's very important that when you have the opportunity to talk about Philip Rivers that you take that opportunity because it's very entertaining to me. I'm out of here. Jason Lockenfora did tweet earlier today. He's hearing a lot of buzz about Tampa as a potential landing spot for Philip Rivers. They did move to Florida. Back in late November, he and the Chargers were likely headed to a parting of the ways what do you think about this rumor, Jason? Are they doing a it's little flip floppy swippy swapski here? Now, how do you go from like the interception king to the other interception king? <laughs> Why is that the? That just seems like you cap your upside because of the age of Philip Rivers. Like, I like the interceptions. I'd like the touchdown total to come down a little bit, though. <laughs> oh, you want to get Rivers? <laughs> Look, oh. I would hate, 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 hate if this happened because if Philip Rivers from the Chargers, I'm like Jameis. Let's go. Sure, if, straight up. If he went to if Philip Rivers went to Tampa, that would be sad. You would have to be in on Rivers' fantasy value, and I refuse to be. So remember that Nick Foles, Sam Bradford straight up trade from a few years back. Sure, yeah, maybe we'll get one of those. A little Philip for Winston in his final year. Let the Chargers worry about that contract. Oh man, not the case. They'll Gross. they'll draft somebody, but um, yeah, I'd- they should just bring back Jameis and have him. G- g- Allow him to have year two it's, with Arians. And yes, they should. Look, for listeners of the show, it brings me great joy to know that it's more likely we'll be talking about a playing football Phillip Rivers next year than it is a retired and out of Jason's heart and mind Phillip Rivers because I want to see you experience Philip all over again. I think Philip Rivers would be an excellent commentator. <laughs> I really do. I think he would be – he'd have fun. Yeah. He'd be one of those guys, he's watching it, he's passionate. Yes. He's enjoying the game while you're enjoying the game. I want that. I want that for him, and I will be his friend again. Did you did you freak out because you just don't want, like, Chris Godwin and Mike Evans dependent on Philip oh, Rivers? I don't. I feel like that's why you, you sat back in your chair like no, that. No, yeah, because I knew if, if he's in this system and he's got those receivers, you're going to have to draft him and play him. And <laughs> It's the last thing you want to do. You can't make me. <laughs> Dalvin Cook at number five. Finished at number five. Was the number two most consistent running back in fantasy. Those first eight weeks, they were beautiful, especially. And uh, wh- where, are you, where are you at with Dalvin? Dalvin, to me, is in the conversation for the number two pick next year. You see this where he's you know the number two most consistent running back because – the our consistency score does not you know it takes out games missed because nobody's putting them in in your lineup so you know the games that he missed does not count against him here this is when he was started and he was in your lineup how would he do and the answer was awesome yes he was fantastic the only issue with dalvin is injury and that's it you don't have a worry about his passing work. You don't have a worry about his goal line work after this year. You don't have a worry about his 
uh, team's desire to utilize him or a coaching change or anything. He is excellent. Is just health. Is he able to withstand the workload that the Vikings want to give him? And I'm going to take my shot that he is because I think mm. that's an honest I think question. He, I think he pretty definitively showed that he could do that. I mean, when you play 14 weeks in the NFL and you hold up, I know the end of the year is going to distort it a little bit, but his shoulders just, it felt like every game towards the end of the year, he, he exited the game late, e even after having good games, he'd have a great game and then uh, break the shoulder again. And, uh, so, but the, the issue is every single running back out there, that's going to get the work. You can ask the honest question of, can he handle it? Cause this is, no human should be put through this. Are you drafting Dalvin Cook? I mean, this is fun to ask, I guess, January 20th, right? But right now, are you higher on Dalvin Cook than Aaron Jones? Yes. yes. I would okay. much rather have Dalvin Cook than Aaron Jones. Yeah, that's... I, I will bring forth the devil's advocate. The devil the, advocate? The devil, Interesting. The, the singular, the devil's advocate uh, position. Number one, Dalvin Cook is heading into a contract year. We are now multiple years in a row where superstar running backs in their contract year say, I'm not going to play until you pay me. Now, I, I spoke with a good, good friend of the show, Paul Charchian, fantasy legend. He's, he's based in Minnesota. His gut take on it was that Dalvin Cook wouldn't hold out. So, I, I, okay, I buy into that, but it's at least a concern. And when you talk about paying – Dalvin Cook, Minnesota's doesn't, got a problem. Yeah, it doesn't seem like something he wants. Here, so they, the, they want to do. So the well, the smallest amount of cap space currently in, heading into 2020 is actually the Pittsburgh Steelers. They have under a million dollars in cap space. That's because the Vikings are nearly five million dollars negative heading into 2020 with their cap. They have a massive problem. They also have a it's called Thielen and Diggs, isn't it? They also have and a cousins, a very very good backup running back that the team likes a lot in Alexander Madison who got more and more involved as the season went along that would be my uh, my my only my, my concerns with like Dalvin Cook should be a top 5 running back easy when you're watching him play his talent levels are off the charts he's making people look silly he makes professional NFL defenders look like peons out there but there are these the, there are things there are peripherals that are it should at least give you pause for concern right well, now. Well, and maybe that'll be the things people are weighing all off season. I, I certainly, while I appreciate the fact that they may like Alexander Madison, to me on film there was there was a pretty wide gap between these two. I doubt that over the course of next year, look, part of winning that division is going to come down to Dalvin Cook. So I still cite on the top five finish for Cook. Well, and and let's also be pragmatic and realize that the limited cap space that the Vikings have is part, you know, that's going to the agent of Dalvin cook knows, Hey, what are you going to hold out for? If they, if they can't do it right now, right. you could threaten and say, Oh, well maybe, but he probably won't because they can't do anything. So yeah, I'm in on Dalvin cook. I, I'm a believer and I, I'm going to take the gamble on his health. All right, Mike, it's your time to sing. It's your time to dance. Number six, overall Austin Eckler, Consistency rank of number four. He had 132 carries. Oh, but he had 92 receptions for 993 yards and eight touchdowns. The old Danny Woodhead. I mean, that's pretty much, I mean, that's a threat to the Christian McCaffrey passing game line there. He just didn't do as much on the ground, but you're talking about a number six overall finish. An incredible first five weeks for fantasy owners that took the chance on him and the Melvin Gordon holdout. And a really interesting dilemma for fantasy owners on where to draft Austin Eckler next year, because not only are you maybe facing down a, you know, he's a restricted free agent. Melvin Gordon's likely to leave town. Phillip Rivers likely to leave town. This is going to be very interesting where he's involved. Now, talent wise, I don't think anybody can complain or argue about what we've seen on film, but everything to me is Phillip Rivers. If Phillip Rivers is gone, I'm, I'm out on wherever Eckler is drafted. I'll probably be below that. ADP. If Rivers is back, I'm in. Whether and, and so this is Melvin Gordon's there. Melvin Gordon's gone. I don't care either way. Basically, if Philip Rivers is the quarterback, I think he 
utilizes a running back like Austin Eckler in the passing game so much that you can rely on him for fantasy purposes. And, and of course, Eckler could be at a different place. So this, this, I don't think this is one of those situations where we can accurately predict anything about Austin Eckler next year, right now. What we have to do is take a look at this year and say, okay, what's the truth? What was the truth about him? And the truth was when you get that level of passing volume, you are consistent. There were so many games. I remember when Melvin Gordon came back listening to um, you know other people say, you should have traded him. You lost your chance. He's, you know, now he's nothing. And I kept thinking like, wait, no, he's going to, he should be fine. He was fine last year when Melvin Gordon, you know, the previous year when Melvin Gordon was there. And, and he was, he certainly didn't have the upside yet, right? Those first four weeks, three of those first four weeks, he was an, it was a top five running back. So he lost that when Melvin Gordon came back, but he was still consistent. He didn't hurt your team, but one time the whole season in any kind of drastic way. And that's all because pass catching backs are, you know, uh, unduly valuable in fantasy football. If you look at the last eight games played over the year, maybe that's a more realistic place to put him. RB 13. Yeah. Over that span. Um, but didn't really beat you up. His worst games were 25th, 29th. I mean, this is... They were, the timing of him was unfortunate. Yeah, it was. But, I mean, all the guys up ahead of him in, over the last eight games in terms of rank, I mean, almost all of them had a bust game. You know, you talk about Aaron Jones had two busts in that span. Kenyon Drake, Alvin Kamara, Todd Gurley, Mark Ingram. Those guys had bust games that Eckler didn't have. And it's always been a challenge for me to, to look at that situation and say, wow... I need to count on the passing game work alone or the passing game touchdown alone. He had eight touchdowns through the air. Well, so next year will be very interesting. Landing spot, quarterback, yeah. all of that. The eight receiving touchdowns, like that's that's not a number you can count on. And as far as receiving backs, I mean, most of the time you're playing them, this is a flex play. This is a... This is my third spot. James White. I you know, like I know I'll get some points. Austin Eckler, though, <laughs> that was the type of passing work that he's actually a running back too, just locked into your lineup. We take a lot of opportunity to insult coaches that seem to do stupid things with stu you know with yes. their personnel. I feel like what happened in you know credit to Anthony Lynn or the, the offensive coaching staff, they started to just involve him in the passing game beyond out of the backfield, lining him up in the slot, calling, you know, pass plays, slant plays to him, getting him more involved because he was he was a weapon that needed to be involved. So I give them a lot of credit for that. If he's still there, you know, they should do that again. So uh, looking at number seven, Nick Chubb. Nicholas. Nick Chubb was number seven overall, number seven in consistency, 298 carries. I think that's a headline for Nick Chubb's season. 1,494 yards, eight touchdowns. Uh, didn't quite nail the preseason prediction that he would lead the AFC in rushing thanks to, I believe, Derrick Henry. But Chubb was up there. And, you know, a really impressive season for a team that kind of didn't find its footing at all during the whole year. <laughs> I mean, 75% good games. They didn't find their footing during all 16 That's games. Pre I mean, I wanted to find when they did, but they really didn't. Uh, disappointing very, very end of the year for Chubb, weeks 16 oh, and 17. Man. It really is. Wolf. It's not just 16 and 17. If you look at the split of when Kareem Hunt came back, this is why, you know, that when, when we project out the full season, I was a little lower on, on Chubb than I wanted to draft him. I wanted to draft him above where I had him ranked because I had the second half of the year worked in. He was the running back five through the first 10 games or the first 10 weeks when, right. when you didn't have um, Kareem Hunt there. From week 11 on, he was a running back 15. That is, uh, those are, you know, the difference between a top, you know, running back five and running back 15, that's pretty drastic. Yeah, but we, you would say that you, if you took the high investment on Nick Chubb, you won. I mean, you talk about the ADP situation for Nick Chubb. If you get 10 weeks at RB5, give me that all day, every day. Sure, but I'm, I wouldn't have regretted it. The reason I'm bringing that up is more of a projection forward. If Kareem Hunt is there at the beginning of next year, people are still viewing Nick Chubb as, you know, uh, if not top five back, very, very close to that spot. He's a top 12 draft pick for me still. Even pick. if Kareem is back? 
Yeah, yeah, I think so. So I mean, I don't think he's. I don't think RB fifteen is where I would bank. You know, the Kareem Hunt experience that you said. I don't think Hunt's going to be back. I don't think he's back either. But if he did, I mean, I put him right. He's going to be in a top my top twelve. Nick Chubb would be because he's great. He's a great running back. He is phenomenal. So if you hope that Stefanski and Baker's better and Odell's better, Chubb is. You know, he put up a number seven overall season and he did it with eight total touchdowns. To me, that's very impressive as a running back. When you have the Aaron Joneses finishing ahead of him or Henry, these guys with high double-digit touchdowns, Chubb played on an offense that consistently struggled and still finished at seven overall at, and seven at consistency. So I have a hard time taking Chubb outside the top 10 after that year myself. I guess I'm more sympathetic to that season and more impressed with what I saw in film. Do, yeah. do, you, have, do you have Nick Chubb? Or uh, I'm sorry, uh, Kareem Hunt. Do you have him leaving the team or staying? Um, I don't understand the contract situation well, well he, enough to. He's restricted, so he will go out and he will try to find offers. I, I you know, if that's and the then case, they have to match. Well, I'm, uh, we'll see what they tag him with. I mean, well, they they could put a they'll they'll probably put a second round tag on him. I think the fact that John Dorsey they'll probably stay. <laughs> yeah, if they put a second if round, they did on that. Him, if they did that, well, to to speak to him leaving, John Dorsey, who drafted him with Kansas City, who then went right, to the Browns yeah. and signed him, that that's who brought him along. I don't think Kareem Hunt, Kareem Hunt, his goal is to go out and get the biggest contract he can, and if there is a suitor, and I think there should be, um, then yeah, he's he could be gone. But the interesting thing with Chubb, and we wondered going into last season about the pass work of Chubb. He wasn't really a pass catching back in college. That's not his specialty. Was he going to get involved? Once you know Hunt came back, he was on pace for 24 receptions on the course of a 16-game season with Hunt there. So whoever it is, if it's Hunt or a Duke Johnson type, um, if they bring someone else in there, I think you have to look at Chubb as a as one of those Marlon Mack, Derrick Henry types that, to me, push him lower if he's not an outlier. I think it's fair. I think that's Derrick Henry light. I mean, that's kind of what you would look at. An offense that you have less confidence in compared to Tennessee if things stayed the same, but a player that's very talented, a player that, you know, Nick Chubb, has that 60-yard, 70-yard touchdown potential all the time. Every and, play. Yeah, I mean, week four, he was the number one overall, number two in week six, number five in week 12. So those weeks are in there. We'll see. There'll be a lot of talk about Kevin Stefanski and what he represents to Nick Chubb's continued uh, high workload. All right, we'll wrap it up with number eight, Mark Ingram. Mark Ingram at number eight, but his consistency rank was 15. Mm. Just 202 carries, right? That's a big piece of the puzzle. 60% of the time, good games. 33% of the time, great games. Did we catch lightning in a barrel with an older Mark Ingram here in Baltimore? with A big whiskey barrel. Yeah, and it caught fire because <laughs> the wood of the barrel when lightning is hard to catch it in a barrel. And so the barrel caught fire. Not a bottle, a barrel. <laughs> yeah, it caught lightning Not in a, a barrel. Not a bottle. You don't want to use a bottle, guys. It's so small. You want to use a fire yeah you uh, wanna, a barrel that's very very yeah flammable mm -hmm. it's always that's what they say whenever you're trying to get that <laughs> lightning put out the wood <laughs> like lightning <laughs> loves the wood gotta catch did we catch lightning in a barrel with mark ingram i would say we didn't we had well i had a few fish in it i was trying to shoot them okay <laughs> but there are all these know, monkeys with little hooks <laughs> You know, it took me like it took me a good ten uh, seconds after I said it to realize the joke. Yeah. Oh, I said barrel. Yeah, lightning in a barrel, <laughs> and we're not gonna let that well, go, as they say. Well, you catch fish in a bottle, guys. Yes, <laughs> <You> catch <laughs> right, fish exactly. Um, okay. Uh, do you have anything to say about Mark Ingram himself? <laughs> yes. Uh, number one, I congratulations to Mark Ingram. That was a much better season than I projected. Picked the for right him. place to sign, didn't he? Oh, absolutely. I mean, he went out. He got he got paid considering his the, his age and the wear and tear. He was on a great team, a, a team that had Super Bowl aspirations. I look for the way that he scored, though. That's I know that's what we're kind of beating to death right now. But the Ravens were so freaking awesome. They they scored so many times. It's just it's not 
something uh, that I'm banking on. Like, I'm not banking on Mark Ingram heading into next year. Sure, he can get over 1,000 rushing yards and maybe even come through with the, the 10 rushing touchdowns. But five receiving touchdowns on 26 receptions? That's just – that that's not happening again. I mean, we, we talked about Austin Eckler's eight – on his ninety plus receptions, as saying that that was that was crazy. Like yep. running running back re- receiving touchdowns, just don't happen. When you're in the twenties, when you're in the twenties in receptions, and you've got five touchdowns receiving, yeah, it's ridiculous. Totally agree, not happening. He's in he's, other words, we're going to be in the same boat we always are with Mark Ingram, yes. and then next perennially year, we'll be, undervalued. Like, Look, I just didn't see it coming. <laughs> He caught lightning in a barrel <laughs> there's, again. There's no way he can do it again. Maybe that's what makes him so special. Maybe. The barrel should be on fire, but it isn't. Well, he is entirely – Steel I mean, barrel. It's, yeah. <laughs> he's entirely dependent Wheel upon barrel. where his ADP is because – Wheel barrel, Andy. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Mike. We're back. <laughs> because the reality is his age has already for the last – It just keeps going up. <laughs> for the last few years – it's made people <laughs> not excited about his uh, potential. They right. think we've seen him. He's older now. So usually when guys are like in that stage of their career, every single year they're undervalued in the 1,500 draft. 1,500 carries, 30 years old. Yeah, he'll be undervalued, and he I mean, probably shouldn't be. Yeah, but, but I don't expect him to be a top. You know, he's the running back eight this year. That seems a little higher than where. What about a top twenty guy? Yes, I think Easy? He'll, okay. yeah, I, I, he's he's still the first uh, guy to run the ball for a run happy team with a great yeah. offense. So I'm I'm in on Mark Ingram um, for next year. I think I'll, he'll probably exceed his ADP because he'll fall too low, but he's not going to repeat the running back eight this year. But the reality is the way that he finished as the running back eight is actually what sucked because he wasn't consistent. Consistency rank of number 15, that feels like where his where rank he his, value, his, his real value was at 15. Exactly. He'll he'll be about there for me next year. Okay. Yeah, he was uh what is this? 43rd in routes rung among running backs. He just had yeah. a lot of meh. A lot of meh games. He he didn't bust. He busted once, but he had so many games that were like, okay, He's there. He well, yeah. Uh, how about you know six carries in a game, eight carries in a game? Those were the weird ones where, you know, if Lamar ended up being the feature back <laughs> of sure. that game, then that's that's what all you needed. All right, that's going to be the pause button on running back truth for today's episode. We're going to get right back into it on Thursday's episode. Some very interesting names. We're going to talk about Leonard Fournette, Saquon Barkley. You know, Alvin Kamara, which, you know, for many, I think surprising to be talking about him on the second truth episode. So a lot of big names to get into it. Look forward to it. But that'll do it for us today. Unless you guys have any parting words. Teach me. Goodbye. Teach me about lightning. That's what I need to know. All right. That is it. Thank you so much for listening to the show. We will see you on Thursday. Have a have an excellent Wednesday. Goodbye. Thank you for listening to another episode of the Fantasy Footballers Podcast. Join our fantasy football community on jointhefoot.com and follow us on Twitter at the FF Ballers. Remember, Foot Clan, with Simply Safe, you get comprehensive enterprise level security for your own home. If there's a break in, Simply Safe uses real video evidence to give police an eyewitness account of the crime, and it costs just 50 cents a day. Visit simplysafe.com slash footballers. You'll get free shipping and a 60-day risk-free trial. You got nothing to lose. Go now to simplysafe.com slash footballers so they know that our show sent you. That's simplysafe.com slash footballers.